Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidil Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I think it's very important for us from time to time to reflect on the shoulders that we stand on because none of us are standing in air. Human beings cannot suspend themselves in air. Like here I am. We're all standing on someone's shoulders. And we should, uh, Sheikh Yasser said a lot of significant things. One thing that amazes me, because people see you up here giving speeches, and some people think, like, you want to be up here. So they call, oh, you're one of those celebrity imams. Like, if you had a choice between being somewhere in a cabin in the woods, surrounded by a bunch of books, with no phone, you wouldn't choose that. But you, you are a celebrity imam. And so they see a celebrity imam, and they come up and they say, you know, I want to be a speaker one day. What a lowly aspiration. Aspire to be a doctor, aspire to be a lawyer, aspire to be a teacher, aspire to be a, an engineer, aspire to be a garbage man, to, to help people to be able to live in a sanitary environment. And if Allah blesses you with the ability, or as they say, the gift of gab, then try to use that feasibility with sincerity. Don't, don't aspire to be a speaker. Because you don't know the tribulation that might bring in your life and you might not be able to handle it. Don't aspire to stand on someone's shoulders. I want to be the one up there. Aspire to be the shoulders that someone else can stand on. And, and, I, and there's a hadith that says just that al-mu'min al-qawi khayrun wa ahabul Allah min al-mu'min al-da'if wa fi kulin khayr the strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer and in each there's good the strong believer is the one someone can stand on their shoulders and if someone doesn't have that strength they're still good wa fi kulin khayr but try to strengthen yourself as people move away from religion, they move towards accepting weakness. And in accepting weakness, accepting that, that the state is going to compensate for my weakness. That this or that agency is going to compensate for my weakness. That other people are going to compensate for my weakness. That's delusion. Now, I'm not saying the state shouldn't have a safety net. There should be a safety net. I'm not saying we shouldn't have institutions to help people who are struggling with that and this, that, and the other in their lives. You should have those institutions. But people should also aspire to be strong and independent and to be able to stand on their own two feet and to be able to provide strong shoulders that others can stand on. When we talk about, we know the sacrifices the Sahaba made, radiallahu anhum, the sacrifices the Tabi'een made, uh, rahimahumullah, the sacrifices those who preceded us in Islam made. And we're standing on their shoulders. But I want to tell, but they're in the giants, our teachers and notables, the people like uh, Jamal Badawi, or Ahmed Saqr, or the people like Imam Warfuddin Muhammad or the people like many many others whose names we don't know but they're all of us are also standing on the shoulders of people whose names aren't known and as I was a convert to Islam some of those people whose shoulders I'm standing on they're not even Muslim There's a guy I remember, five, how many of you remember much, can remember a song you learned when you were five years old? Raise your hand. We got a few. 
Mashallah, when I was about five years old in Atlanta, Georgia, in a place called Carver Homes, southwest Atlanta, Georgia, there was a, a guy older than us, and I think he died. We, we were in the neighborhood when he died or was severely injured, and he subsequently died. He was in a go-kart, and the go-kart went out of control, and he went under a car on the go-kart. His name is Hinderly Turpentine. Hinderly Turpentine. I remember his name. And he taught us this song. I have to censor it because we're in the masjid. <laughs> he taught us this song. I went to the barn to milk my cow way in the middle of the night to tell you the truth I didn't know how way in the middle of the night. I pulled his tail and pulled it boop, way in the middle of the night. And all I got was buckled away in the middle of the light. Why don't you come along, little children, come along, while the moon is shining bright, shining bright. <laughs> this hindered the but what I want to say, you know what he used to do to us? He used to bring us. He was significantly bigger, and he would like fire us up, shoulder, chest, bam, don't you cry, bam, don't you cry, bam, don't you cry. He said, and what he was doing, some brothers laughed, they had a Henderly in their neighborhood. <laughs> huh? Yeah, you were the Henderlies. <laughs> but what they were doing, they let us know, you know what? It's a hard world out there. They weren't deceiving us like it's peaches and cream and hunky and dory. That same time a song came out, Johnny Cash. He wrote a song and sung a song called A Boy Named Sue. Some of you remember that. Johnny Cash, A Boy Named Sue. It was about uh, a guy who was getting ready to leave his wife. They had one child, so he knew he wasn't going to be there to protect that child. And so he named him Sue. Because he knew as soon as he went to school, people were going to start teasing him and about his name. And he'd get into a lot of fights, and he would learn how to fight and protect himself because he wouldn't have a father there to look after him. So he named him Sue. So go and Google that when you go home. Don't do it now. A lot of you like to Google while people are giving speech. A boy named Sue, Johnny Cash. Uh, he, he, you can't Google Hinder Lee Turpentine. Go talk to Brother Rashid. Why do I say that? Because we betray those whose shoulders we're standing on when we don't fight for this religion. There are too many people who say they're Muslims who aren't willing to fight for Islam. And I'm not talking about a physical fight, so you don't have to stop the live stream. Let me make that clear. I'm not talking about a physical fight. I'm talking about when some atheistic fool comes up in you and talk about, oh, blah, 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 and you're ready to give up your dean and not even fight for it. Just tell him, get out of my face. You don't believe in God? That's your problem. You probably commit suicide in five years because you don't have any purpose in your life. Instead of fighting for it, you're ready to just give up. And we can make hundreds of examples that are happening every day. We betray those who fought for us to be able to say, La ilaha illallah. We betray those who fought so that that Quran could be translated and get it into our hands. We betray those who built this masjid. What's going to happen to this masjid 10, 20, 30 years down the line when this bunch of youth who should be here now and they're the elders who are holding it down, they gave up on Islam because people were looking at them funny. This group, they gave up because people were teasing them for wearing a rag on their head. This group, they gave up because they weren't sure that what, who, or, who or what they were, what the identity was. I'm not even talking about just sexual identity. They didn't even know if they're a human being. So they just gave up. And these gave up for that reason. And those gave up for this reason. And none of them were willing to fight for their religion. And to fight for the sacrifices that their parents and their grandparents made. We're standing on someone's shoulders. We're, we're the end of a long line 
of people who sacrifice for us to be able to say la ilaha illallah I said some of them were Muslim if you're Muslim and you're free and you enjoy this all this freedom and you can live and your skin is brown or black and you can live in a white neighborhood you're standing on the shoulders of Dr. King and Rosa Parks and Fannie Lou Hamer and all those people who struggled and sacrificed for some for a dignified living for people in this country we're standing on the shoulders of giants we're standing on the shoulders of giants and some of those giants their names aren't known as Sheikh Yasser said i could tell you people when i was nobody when i was someone who be in the back of this room in the corner people coming in they just walk over me cuz they want to get up front to listen to the speaker there were people who said you know we're going to do something we're going to start a little masjid because we need to meet making dawah in this city and i just came back from egypt but not from al azhar i just spent 11 months in egypt beginning to learn arabic and these people they didn't know alif from ba or ta and because i knew alif ba ta they said you're going to be the imam that's how it was at one time were our our father of qiraat were the ones who qiraat al ash they were the ones who memorized the first 10 letters of the arabic alphabet say alif ba ta fa kha ji ji kha ha dal dal ant hafiz al qiraat al ash you're the imam and now <laughs> Subhanallah. But I tell you something. They'll die for you. They'll die for you. They'll sacrifice. They'll spend a little bit of money we had, they had. And they'll appreciate a little bit of love. Cuz a little bit of love goes a long way. One thing we we get away from the basics. Now we we're, we're up here sometimes and we we project that sentiment down on anyone down there. Think they understand the issues we understand. They look at the world the way we look at the world. they're bogged down in the pettiness the higher you go the the pettier things can get because you lose a sense of perspective from way up there and they project all that down and these are the people who are down there they know it's real they know it's life and death in many situations and because of that they're willing to give their life and they're willing to sacrifice and they're willing to let people stand on their shoulders if it's going to serve the greater good they don't care if they're not the ones standing on someone else's shoulder therefore they're not raised and elevated you can't see them they don't care as long as they're providing the shoulders for someone else to stand on can help to advance the cause and that's what we have to focus on brothers and sisters the cause we have a mission we're not here in vain we're not feathers just waiting to be blown whichever way the wind blows we're here to take that message that gave many of us life All right when i be, when i converted to islam i couldn't talk about it for about 18 months 2 years we have these give testimonial <laughs> it was powerful because i knew without islam i probably be where a lot of my friends were there or are now 
Many of them are dead for various reasons. I could just as well have been them if it weren't for Islam. That could have been me if it wasn't for Islam. But Allah blessed me with this religion. And he, 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 he blessed me to know Imam Siraj Wahaj. So I'm going to segue into that. So we said we started this little masjid. They said, you're going to be the Imam. And right around that time is when all that, he cleaning up the streets in Brooklyn and all that, we said, we're going down to help Imam Siraj Wahaj. Before that, I, one of the first masjids I sat in after I converted in 1977 was Imam Siraj's masjid. My wife, I was in the military. I'm from Connecticut, my wife's from Long Island. So we go visit her family, and for Juma, we ride into New York City to Masjid at Taqwa in Brooklyn. And they had this theater. And I sit in the balcony, way in the back, and listen to Imam Siraj Wahaj and get inspired. And when they had the, the drug thing, we got a group of brothers. We were in New Haven, Connecticut, hour and a half from Masjid Taqwa. We jump in our cars and we drive down to Brooklyn and we go and join the ranks with Imam Siraj's, with his people, helping to patrol those neighborhoods and clean up those neighborhoods. And Allah blessed me to establish a, a relationship with the Imam Siraj. So when we opened our little storefront masjid in New Haven, Connecticut, that was probably, the whole masjid was probably from, from, this, mem from this wall to where Brother Yusuf is right there. Maybe, no, with this brother with the sky blue shirt squared. That was the masjid. The second Juma we had, there was a snowstorm. There were three people for Juma. I was the khatib, my wife was there, and a sister named Iman. The sister Iman. Sister Allah alone, Iman. Because you meet that, salam alaikum, Allah alone. Sister Iman. Tawheed Iman, Allah alone. How you doing, sister? Allah alone. Sister, can you say anything besides Allah alone, Allah alone? <laughs> it was me, my wife, and sister Iman. That was it. Then we had the grand opening. Imam Siraj brought a group of Muslims, of brothers and sisters. Of, I, don't, I think they came in a bus, because they had their own bus, up to New Haven. And he was there at the inauguration. No, we knew him from Rutgers University when I was a student. We bring him to the MSA. And he come. And then when we started the masjid in New Haven, he came. Then when we had, you know, we, we said, Imam Siraj can clean up the neighborhood, we can clean up the neighborhood. So we started our own drug patrols in the projects, and, but they used to call our crew F Troop. Some of you, that you can't relate to that. <laughs> so F Troop got busted by the cops trying to clean up the name. Like the dope dealers called the cops on us. <laughs> we had seven brothers and sisters arrested, weapons confiscated. But Imam Siraj, then it was a big trial. And we had, alhamdulillah, the, the police knew we were cleaning up the neighborhood, so they were actually on our side. So how, how this all happened, they, the police were on strike. The police can't strike, so they have what you call the blue flu. They all call in sick at the same time. And so they called up the auxiliary police. They didn't know what was going on, because they didn't know when the dope dealers called the cops on the Muslims, the cops, auxiliary cops, when the chief found out, he said, man, y'all crazy. <laughs> and the people in the neighborhoods, this was important to be working in your neighborhood. The people in the neighborhood said they arrested the Muslims all in the news. They went down and protested on the steps of the courtyard. And then we all, the courthouse. And then we, we organized the people and the, the, the police chief 
the uh, district attorney, they said, listen, because the police chief had higher political aspiration, we were embarrassing him. He said, stop the demonstrations, we'll work this out. So at that time, possession of a weapon was a mandatory five-year sentence, felony, because there were so many drug-related killings, the crack wars. And they rewrote all their charges as a misdemeanor and put all these seven brothers in ex accelerated rehabilitation. If they didn't do anything for a year, they expunged their record. And on the day of the trial, after one year, when their records were clean, Imam Siraj brought a busload of brothers and sisters from Brooklyn into the courtroom. That's, that's Imam Siraj Wahaj. Imam Siraj is there and has been there. So we know about the fundraising, but he's been there for communities, in inner city communities, for poor communities. He's been there. When I, when I left New Haven, I'll tell you, I'm only out here because Imam Siraj gave me permission to be here. That's the truth. He gave me permission to be here. And the day we had, my wife is a witness. So I went to Syria and came back and stayed almost two years. And then we said, okay, we're going to the Bay Area. So we had, we had a big farewell. It wasn't big, it was little. There was about 10 people from New Haven were there. Sister Iman, Allah alone, was there. <laughs> about nine other people. But there was a busload of people from Brooklyn, from Master Taqwa. Every step of the way, Imam Siraj was there. So you don't have to tell me about Imam Siraj. And what he meant for me is personal. And the sacrifices that he made for this community. So we pray that we're able to support him and his family, his grandchildren. The adults, they're responsible. The grandchildren, they're caught up in a situation, they're all in custody, and he's trying to get them back. So the only thing I know, we're not supposed to fundraise here, so I'm not going to fundraise. I'm just telling you to go to this link, launchgood.com slash ISW Imam Siraj Wahaj, and go to that link and then do something for Imam Siraj. So if that's fundraising, I just broke the rules. But that wasn't fundraising. Fundraising is you grab people by the ankles and you shake as hard as you can. <laughs> they have brothers sweeping up. Get some, you don't just lock the door. You post up some big brothers. And when you go towards the door, they look at you and you turn around and go sit back down. <laughs> May Allah bless this community. This is a beautiful community. It's a, it's a community where there's, there's a lot of love, there's a lot of vision, and there's, there are very dedicated young people. But there are a lot of challenges facing all of us, and especially the young people. And so, brothers and sisters, look, go get some of those old Imam Siraj tapes, as I think uh, Omar Suleiman mentioned. Ask your parents. I mean, you still got some old... Imam Siraj Wahaj tapes in the closet and listen to those tapes. Listen to, to, to the stories, the advice, the wisdom of people who were shaped in another place and time. Because it benefits us. Sometimes we can become so blinded by our time, we think that's all, the, the, all there is and that's all there ever was. And that's all there will be. Now, this is the time. I, I, I don't, increasingly, I know I don't understand it. Seriously. Because I was shaped in another time. And things were extremely different. You know, you, it was a time where you could tell people, you know, you need to straighten up. 
Uh, you could tell people, like, sister, you need to go put some clothes on. You do that stuff now, people might accuse you of microaggressions and, you know, blame you for their suicide. You know, suicide, no brother told me I was, didn't have clothes on. Hey, don't laugh. So it, it benefits us for reflecting back on another time and another place where the influences that shaped people's lives were different from the influences currently shaping people's lives. And maybe some of that stuff that Sheikh Yasser Qadi was talking about, maybe some of that stuff will rub off on us. Maybe some of that will touch us. And maybe that will inspire us to have a little more straightness in our backbone, to have a little more pep in our step, to have a little more fight in our hearts, to have a little more love and cherishing for this religion, to see what it did for others, and to see that we shouldn't take it for granted, as sometimes we do. Not, and we, not all of us. There are people in here that have that pep in their step, and that they have that straightness in their backbone, and they have that fire in their belly, there are people like that, but increasingly, we see other than that. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq. May Allah give us strength. May Allah Ta'ala bless us with the vision. May Allah Ta'ala inspire us to understand that we are the latest runners in a long race. It's a relay race. I used to run track, and I ran the relay. I ran four by one ten. And you run, run, you get a running start. Look at the running start. That's Yasser Qadi was talking about it. You have a running, when you have, you can order books online. You have teachers in every masjid. The, the person who's hafiz of kiraat is actually hafiz kiraat and not the first 10 letters of the alphabet. That's a running start. So you got a running start. And then they say, like, stick. Like, put your hand out and get the batons, you drrr, bam, now you got it. And you run as hard as you can to give it to the next man. And if you drop it, everybody loses. If you drop that baton, everybody loses. And it's not about who has the fastest runners. So if you follow the Olympics, the last few Olympics, the US, there are four, like Hussein Bolt, the Muslim Jamaican run, I say Hussein, Hussein, Hussein Bolt. Well, they can't pronounce the H in Jamaica. Anyway, they had Hussein Bolt. They had the one fastest runner. But as a team, the U.S. should have had three or four gold medals. The last few Olympics, they dropped the baton and they lost. So it's not always about who has the fastest runners. It's about who has the most dedicated team that's going to practice passing the baton. Who has the most dedicated team? Who is committed to teamwork? That's what it's about. So may Allah bless us to be a cohesive team that is committed to not dropping the, the baton. And when we get to the end of our leg, so the stretch you call is called a leg. When you get into your leg, you're going to pass that baton. And then you might just collapse. Not for a 4 by 110 you're not going to collapse. 4 by 400 you pass that baton, cramp up, and collapse. And they'll say, Alhamdulillah, he left it all out there on the track. And when each and every one of us, when we pass, May they say, Alhamdulillah, he or she left it all out there in the masjid. They left it all out there in the, in the center. They left it all out there in the community room, in the teaching hall. They gave everything they had. And Alhamdulillah, because of those sacrifices, as I looked at them, down at them, writhing in pain, dealing with those cramps, they got the baton into my hand. And I'm not going to drop the baton. Assalamu alaikum wa